My name is Rob Stevens, and welcome to this video presentation on a mine closure case study called Inclusive Closure and the Post-Mining Transition at the Golden Pride Mine in Tanzania. This case study, the front cover of which you can see here, was recently published by the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining, Minerals, Metals, and Sustainable Development, also known as the IGF. I would like to acknowledge my co-authors on this uh, case study. So I'm one of the authors, as well as Jackie Hartnett, who was the former manager of closure at the Golden Pride Mine when all of the activities that we're going to talk about took place. And also Gideon Kasage, the former head of the Environmental Management Unit at the Ministry of Minerals in Tanzania, and he was a key government uh, representative involved in closure uh, of the Golden Pride Mine. So in this presentation, it's just going to be a highlight of some of the aspects of the case study and to you know, get the full uh, story, uh, please look at the publication. But we're going to start off with a regional setting and an overview of the mine site. Then we're going to talk about some key aspects of the closure. So community and regular uh, regulator engagement, post-mining land uses, security in small-scale miners, and lessons learned and policy recommendations. All right, let's get a, a, a ourselves set and where this mine is located. So it is located in West Central Tanzania, and it's a region that consists of Miombo woodlands, grasslands, and agriculture, with a fairly distinct dry season between May and October. Several communities surround the mine site, and some of the challenges in the area include limited formal employment, deforestation, as well as somewhat limited access to both potable and agricultural water, uh, particularly during the dry season. And here's a photograph of the mine uh, as it was during operation in 2005. So it was an open pit gold mine that operated for about 15 years, between 1998 and 2013, uh, by Australian-based Resolute Mining. A little over 2 million ounces of gold were produced during that time uh, frame. And the closure plan was approved by Tanzanian authorities in 2011, and final closure and relinquishment of this site occurred in 2015. So here's a view, uh, an aerial shot of the mine site, so you can get a sense of the different components that were present. Uh, so the main one was the open pit, which you can see in the sort of lower half of the diagram, uh, the photograph here. Surrounding the open pit were a number of waste rock disposal uh, areas. There were also turk two circular ring dike tailings disposal areas you can see in the left hand side of the photograph as well as a number of uh, buildings and labs and other um, uh, infrastructure uh, that was part of the mine so first of all community and regulator engagement so engagement of the mine operator with communities government regulators stakeholders is a key part of developing mine closure plans in regard to community engagement, at Golden Pride, they used a participatory rural engagement approach. And they actually started that early in about the year 2000, so quite a long way in advance of closure. Participatory rural engagement empowers local rural communities to identify development uh, solutions. Uh, they create those solutions, they participate in the implementation of them, and the evaluation. And this approach specifically includes women and a wide spe spectrum of society such that projects are broadly based and widely supported. In terms of the regulator and government engagement, they were engaged through the National Mine Closure Committee that was formed according to Tanzanian regulation. And this committee consists of a broad range of representatives from the national government, including uh, individuals from a ministry such as mining, environment, water, and land use planning, as well as representatives from regional and district governments. All right, post-mining land uses. Uh, a number of people will, and will say that decisions around post-mining land uses are really the most important ones that are made during closure because most of your other closure plans and activities flow out from those decisions on post-mining land uses. So a wide range of different uses were considered by the mine uh, together with communities and regulators. And in the end, three main uh, end land uses were decided upon. The first was to reclaim the site to a Miombo woodland and allow for low impact activities such as beekeeping. Most natural woodlands uh, in the region have been uh, cut down, so this was an opportunity to re-establish a woodland in the area. 
The second was to reuse facilities on the site and the site overall as a training and educational center for geology and mining students uh, at the Mineral Resources Institute, which is part of the University of Dar es Salaam. And finally, to partially backfill the open pit and turn the remainder of it into a water reservoir that could be used for agricultural and irrigation purposes. All right, so let's take a look at those uh, one at a time. Uh, first of all, uh, reclamation. So reclamation really required early planning in order to harvest soil and cover material that could be used as reclamation activities took place. So for example, uh, before starting your open pit or placing any waste rock pile on the surface, soil and, and cover material is stripped off and stored so it can be used later in uh, reclamation. Another key part of it was that the mined landforms were designed to shed water off of those landforms and as much as possible into the open pit to help support filling of that pit with water. And in this photograph here, what you can see is they're placing soil and cover material over one of the tailings disposal areas. Uh, and they've created quite a rough surface, uh, which is a, a great uh, surface uh, for plants to take a hold. So you can plant them in the dips where there's a little bit more water is held uh, and vegetation much more readily takes a hold in this kind of landscape than a hard packed uh, soil. Here's an example of one of the tailings disposal areas uh, uh, just before it's going to be planted with, uh, with some vegetation. And you can see a number of features uh, that have developed on this circular uh, structure. And those are mainly surface drainage control features uh, so that erosion wouldn't take place and cut down into the, uh, into the tailings area and also to support that shedding of water as much as possible into the open pit. And you can also see some of the reclamation around the lower edges of the tailings area have taken hold very nicely. Uh, on this top photograph, uh, here's some examples of the bushes and trees that um, were propagated in a nursery on the site that could be then used for reclamation. And the bottom uh, site is a reclaimed area uh, in the tailings disposal region. Uh, about two years after reclamation, uh, you can see the vegetation is taking a hold quite nicely uh, with a, a mix of species consistent with that Miombo woodland. So the second key uh, mining land use uh, was as a training facility. So part of the site, as I mentioned, is being turned over to the Mineral Resources Institute, uh, which is a part of the School of Mines and Geosciences at the University of Dar es Salaam. So that provides a field-based uh, educational facility, both for geology and mining students. It's also importantly providing training for legally registered small-scale miners in the area. And just its presence also discourages illegal use of the closed site uh, or the closed mine site by, for, for timber harvesting or for mining uh, or for cattle grazing. And here's just a couple of photographs, uh, dorms and facilities in the top uh, photo, and then one of the classrooms uh, at the bottom here. All right, closure of the open pit. This was another uh, key uh, decision that was made as part of closure. Uh, and there was a lot of debate that uh, went on between the company and communities and regulators about this. At one point, there was a desire to completely backfill the open pit, although that was deemed, deemed not feasible for, for a, or economic uh, for a number of different reasons. In the end, it was decided to partially backfill the open pit and let the remainder of the pit fill up with water so it could be used for uh, agricultural purposes. Uh, and in the bottom uh, photograph that you see here, uh, the partially backfilled uh, part of the pit occurs in the left-hand side of the pit, um, and uh, then the remainder of the pit there, which will fill with water. You can also see, again, a, a nice development of uh, vegetation on the reclaimed waste rock pile, which lies just to the right of the open pit. And here now is the open pit as it uh, occurs roughly today. This was a shot taken in February, 2022. So the, the pit like reservoir is filling very quickly. In fact, it's filling quite a bit faster than was originally uh, planned. Original estimates were that it would take uh, maybe up to 32 years after closure. Uh, and here we are really only seven or eight years after closure. Uh, and it's expected that it might reach capacity in just a few years. Now, another important issue that really needs to be considered at a closed mine is site security and small-scale miners. 
if there are small scale miners working around where that mine site is, you can expect that they are likely going to want to get access to that site uh, after it has closed. And that can be a challenge and it can disrupt some of the workings that have uh, the closure works that have already been completed on that site. So at Golden Pride, they considered this and implemented a number of things to help reduce uh, infiltration of that site, particularly by illegal miners. So for example, the presence of the Mineral Resources Institute uh, has reduced the use of the site by illegal miners. The, the government has issued licenses to legally registered small scale miners over parts of that site. And the Mineral Resources Institute provides training to those legally registered uh, miners on environmentally and sound mining practices. And then finally, just the flooding of the open pit uh, reduces access to potential ore that those small scale miners might like to, uh, to work on. And here's just a photo. Um, uh, this is an, uh, an actually an illegal miners that are on the site. And they've built this access shaft with a winch uh, to get down underground. Uh, and you can see a fellow sitting there uh, getting a little bit of shade on this hot day. So what does the site look like uh, roughly now in 2022, seven, eight years after closure? So reclamation and closure works have stabilized. Vegetation is well established and maturing. The pit lake, as we saw, is filling fast and there are catfish and tilapia present in the lake. The Mineral Resources Institute remains active on the site. But there are some challenges uh, and that includes some wood harvesting uh, and burning to support livestock grazing. There are unfortunately unsafe illegal miners operating the site and there's reports that they are using mercury uh, in the lake to wash their workings. And plans have not yet been developed for an irrigation system uh, or a means of harnessing the water in the open pit. Now, it is recognized that this pit is filling much faster than originally planned uh, and, and so it will take some time for those uh, uh, plans on how to access and use that water. It'll take some time for those to develop. So let's le uh, look at some lesson learned and policy recommendations. So the first one is ensure early and regular engagement. Mine operators should be engaging with communities and regulators really before the mine even starts at the earliest stages to plan for what closure will look like. Uh, just as one example uh, at Golden Pride, uh, the final plans for the open put took six years of consul consultations, studies, and assessments before the final decisions were made. So plenty of time needs to be given for those discussions to take place. Allow for adaptable post-mining land uses. Uh, post-mining land uses are a key decision, but one also has to recognize that a mine, particularly one that might operate for decades, that there's going to be a lot of changes in the communities and the environments around that mine site during that period of operation. So those post-mining land uses do need to be adaptable to change uh, to reflect those circumstances. And at Golden Pride, in fact, uh, the final decisions on uh, end land use did change almost up until the point of closure. Third recommendation is require progressive reclamation. Starting reclamation early reduces the impact of the mine and allows the operator to learn and demonstrate the effectiveness of their reclamation methods. At Golden Pride, by the time the mine hit official closure, uh, a healthy and productive growing forest was ha taking place. And some initial uh, challenges with erosion uh, were addressed uh, during the operation uh, so that at closure, uh, they could ensure the physical stability of waste rock and tailings facilities. Plan for post-mining use of the site by small-scale miners. If there are small-scale miners operating around that site, you can expect that they're going to want to get access after it closes. That can be a challenging situation, and there's often no easy solutions, but it should be factored into the decisions that are made around closure. And as I mentioned earlier at Golden Pride, they took a number of steps to provide legal access to the site for small-scale miners, to train them, and, uh, and to and put in place other activities to reduce uh, the use of the site by illegal miners. The fifth one is to establish closure committees. Closure committees that are formed early before the mine even goes into operation can be a very effective tool for ongoing engagement throughout the mine life. And at the case of uh, Golden Pride, uh, they used the participatory rural engagement approach, and they also had the national mine closure committees that were formed early and were 
uh, used as a key engagement vehicle throughout the mine life. And then finally, harness local uh, uh, leading global practices. At Golden Pride, a best practice approach was used to closure by supplementing and building on Tanzanian requirements at the time with leading closure practices required in Australia. Not every jurisdiction can or has developed uh, uh, you know, leading practices for closure, but there's no reason why those practices developed elsewhere can't be adapted and adopted for uh, different jurisdictions and required of mine operators uh, in those jurisdictions to ensure closure is taking place uh, and conducted at the highest of standards. All right, well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that video on uh, the closure of the Golden Pride Mine. And as I mentioned, I really encourage you to go to the IGF website to review the publication, igfmining.org, and you can find that and many other publications uh, produced by uh, the IGF. Thank you very much.